yeah, this is our um, the last talk of the year in the seminar, and we're uh, very happy to have Pavel Ettingoff from MIT, and he will tell us about Frobenius exact tensor categories. Go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm very happy uh, to speak here. Uh, so I will uh, please uh, interrupt me. Uh, uh, if you have a question rather than writing in a chat because I'm not it's not easy for me to watch the chat. Uh, okay, so uh, so this is joint work with uh, Kevin Kulimbier and Victor Ostrich, uh, and this is still ongoing joint work so we do not have a paper online, hopefully in the next month or so, it will be there, we are writing it. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, so this is a certain theorem in uh, the theory of tensor categories that was a conjecture for several years uh, due to Victor Ostrich, and uh, we finally were able to prove this conjecture, and this has some uh, pretty nice applications to classical representation theory of uh, groups and group schemes in positive characteristics. So let me first describe those applications, and then I will explain how uh, to use tensor categories for those applications. Oh, so, Pavel, Pavel, yes. uh, excuse me. Uh, can you rotate it landscape to make it bigger, bigger for us to see it? Bigger? Is it possible? Like if you rotate it, uh, you put it landscape, then probably ah, it's... like this. Yes. Ah, okay. Well, I mean, you, you will get to see less of a page, but the letters will be larger. Yeah, if if other people don't mind. Yeah, it's easier to see. Thank you. Okay, fine. Yeah, I can do that. All right. So, uh, so let G uh, be a finite group and P a prime number. And the interesting case would be when P divides the order. And let B be a finite dimensional representation of G over algebraically closed field K of characteristic P. So then uh, I'm uh, so, so studying, uh, uh, you know, irreducible representations is a hard problem, but a lot is known for many groups. But if you want to study indecomposable representations, this problem is extremely hard and very little is known. And in fact, even if you take something like Z mod two cubed in characteristic two or Z mod three cross Z mod three in characteristic three, but then we know almost nothing about the, the indecomposable representations. You cannot classify them. This is a wild problem. And how they behave under the tensor product is a very mysterious and difficult problem. Almost nothing is known. And this is in particular to report some progress on that. So uh, we will define, and, and this paper was uh, very much, I mean, at least this part applications was very much inspired by the work of Dave Benson and uh, uh, Peter Simons uh, uh, in this direction. Uh, so uh, let dn of v uh, denote the number of indecomposable direct summons uh, uh, in uh, v to the n. Of, and, but we will only count those direct summons which have dimension co prime to p. In particular, we will not cover projects, we will not count projectives, and we will not cover any other ones that have dimension divisible by P. We'll only count those that have dimension co-prime to P. So that turns out to be a little bit more tractable. Uh, and uh, one thing that is clear is that uh, this is a uh, super multiplicative. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so if you have uh, dn plus m of V is at least dn of V times dm of V. Well, simply because if you have two indecomposables of dimension co prime to P, their tensor product also has dimension co prime to P, and therefore it has to have at least one sum of dimension co prime to P. So, Pasha, do I understand correctly that we count uh, just the total number, not the number up to isomorphism? Uh, the total with multiplicities, yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, uh, and another obvious thing is that this number dn of v is uh, less than or equal than the dimension of v to the power n. Well, that's simply because every such representation has dimension at least one. Now, there is a lemma in elementary analysis uh, 
uh, that I recommend uh, uh, everybody to prove for yourself uh, due to Tekete, uh, uh, which says that if, a, if you have a sequence of positive numbers satisfying uh, this inequality, which is called the super multiplicativity, uh, and uh, this sequence is uh, exponentially bounded, uh, then uh, uh, oh, there is a limit uh, of the sequence uh, nth root of the sequence, which is a positive number, uh, 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 which is a certain positive number. And uh, so we will define d of v uh, to be this number. And it's greater or equal to zero because it's possible, for example, if our representation has no summons, uh, of uh, no indecomposable summons of dimension divisible by p, uh, so all indecomposable summons have dimension divisible by p, then uh, we will have zero because all of these numbers are going to be zero. And the reason is that well, you can prove, it's not completely obvious, but it's not hard to show that if you have uh, a representation, so representations of dimension divisible, indecomposable representations of dimension divisible by p, uh, define a tensor ideal in the sense that if you tensor such a representation with any indecomposable and decompose it into direct sum of indecomposables, uh, all summons will have dimension divisible by p. By the way, I'm using here uh, implicitly the cruel schmidt theorem, which says that in, in any such situation, the decomposition into indecomposables is unique up to an isomorphism and up to order of sum. Now, what are the obvious property of this number D of V? So it's like a growth rate for V. And uh, well, one obvious property is that D of direct sum is greater or equal than the sum of Ds. D of V plus W is greater or equal than D of V plus D of W. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, but but uh, but it's not clear that they actually equal. And uh, another thing that's easy also that d of v tensor w is greater or equal than d of v tensor d of w. So you can uh, you can check these for yourselves. That's pretty easy. Another uh, thing that's clear is that uh, if this d of x is zero, this is equivalent to all indecomposable summons of x having dimension divisible by p. Uh, this uh, follows from what I just said. And such representations are called neg negligible and they form a tensor ideal in the category of representations. So if you tensor them with any representation, you get a negligible representation. And another thing, if d of x is positive, which is equivalent to having at least one sum of dimension four prime to p, then uh, this uh, d of x is at least one and less than or equal than the dimension of x. Well, it's less than or equal than the dimension because of the inequality. Right? stated before, and of course, greater or equal to one because all those numbers dn of x are greater or equal to one. Well, that's about it, of what you can say from general principles. Uh, and then uh, you can, it's not easy to say much more just by elementary means. But it turns out that we can actually say a lot more if you use the theory of tensor categories. And here is the theorem. So this is what we proved. Uh, so first of all, this D extends to a character of the split Grothendieck ring of rep G. So in other words, we have equalities here and here. D of V plus W equals to D of V plus D of W. And D of V tensor W is equal to D of V times D of W. And uh, another thing is what kind of values can this uh, invariant take? Uh, a priori, it is an arbitrary positive real number, but actually there are very restricted set of values it can take, uh, namely let Q be e to the pi i over p. So this is a, a root of unity of order two p and let us uh, define Q analog of uh, integer m is Q to the m minus Q to the minus m over Q minus Q inverse for the uh, natural number m. Then for every x in uh, this category, D of X is a linear combination of those M Qs where M uh, goes between one and P over two. Uh, and uh, 
the combination is with non-negative integer coefficients. So in particular, if you p equal two and three, so in that case, m is necessarily equal to one. And uh, so this number is also one. And uh, this means that the d of x is just an integer. Uh, if p is greater than three, this number doesn't have to be an integer. Uh, and here is an example. So suppose we take p equal five and take the group g equal to z mod five and take b to be j3, which is the three dimensional indecomposable representation given by this Jordan block. So this one, the generator of z mod five, we view it as also as an element of f5 maps uh, to this matrix. This matrix to the fifth power in characteristic five equals one. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, so we can uh, now look at the tensor powers of this representation. Well, uh, one can show that only the odd sized Jordan blocks appear. It's pretty easy to see. And uh, so there is gonna be a n copies of one by one block and b n copies of three by three block and c n copies of five by five blocks. It cannot be bigger than that because this is a group of order five. So now how does the tensoring look like here? So if we tensor V, which is J3 with J1, obviously we just get J3, but if you tensor V with J3, so J3 tensor J3, well, we know that the Jordan blocks tensor in the same way as representations of SL2 in characteristic zero. Well, in characteristic five, when the characteristic P at some point it changed, it, it, is, it deviates from that, but we are below this point. So J3 tensor J3 is still J1 plus J3 plus J5. And, but on the other hand, if I tensor J3 with J5, that's not J3 plus J5 plus J7 because we don't have J7. It's actually three copies of J5 because J5 is a projective module. So the tensor product of anything with projective would be projective. The tensor product also it's, it's negligible. So if I tensor it with anything, I should get something negative. And so that's what it looks like. And so therefore I get, uh, if I tensor this uh, equation with B, uh, what I get, I get a recursion for these coefficients A and B. Well, there is also a recursion for C, but it's not interesting for me because this is uh, uh, dimension divisible by five, which I'm going to ignore. So what I'll get is A n plus one equals to B n and also B n plus one equals to A n plus B n. And this means that bn plus one equals to bn plus bn minus one. And this is the recursion for the Fibonacci numbers. So, uh, well, it doesn't, uh, so bn is the solution of the Fibonacci recursion. You can determine exactly which one by looking at the initial values. It's not important for us. What's important is that it's going to, uh, uh, the growth rate for the sequence. So if you take root of degree n of bn, as you know, for Fibonacci equation, it is uh, one plus square root of five over two, the golden ratio. And note that this is the Q analog of two, where Q is equal to e to the uh, pi i over five. And so this means that in characteristic five, according to this main theorem, and well, according to the theorem, this invariant D of X for any representation will just be R plus S times golden ratio, where R and S are uh, non-negative integers. And I should mention uh, finally that uh, uh, this, uh, there is nothing special here about finite groups. I just uh, considered finite groups to make things more elementary. But if you have any affine group scheme over a field of characteristic P, uh, the, same st the same theorem applies. Okay, so now I will uh, try to explain how uh, the theory of tensor categories can be used to prove this result uh, and what else you can get. But before that, uh, are there any questions? Sorry, which theorem again holds for any group? The same theorem. Uh, so that this uh, D of uh, X extends to a character of the split uh -huh. growth string, and that uh, the values are uh, of the form uh, of this form. Actually, the actual theorem is much more precise than that, but uh, what we can formulate in completely elementary term is uh, is this and a few more things, which I may say later. Uh, any questions? 
So there are some congruences that this quantum number satisfy. Do they play a role here? Well, uh, yes. So, so for example, uh, uh, well, for example, modulo p, these numbers are Q analog of m is congruent to m, or rather, not modulo p, but modulo. Uh, okay, so when you consider the image in, uh, in characteristic p here, and that certainly plays a role. It's like uh, this comes from the quantum group, but uh, so to speak. But when q becomes one, uh, this uh, uh, turns into the usual image. Pavel, I have a question. Yes. Um, if you take the um, Z mod PZ in characteristic P and you, you you look at the dimension of the whatever Jordan block, do you get the corresponding quantum number? Yes, exactly. Yes. Cool. So so I did I did J3, and so I go I, I got three Q analog of three, which is the same as Q analog of two in characteristic five uh, for P equals five. But in general, if I take uh, J uh, K, uh, then I will get the Q analog of K. Uh, I think Ben asked about Z mod P power N. So, so this might be. I, I didn't ask that. But... Ah, you did not. Okay. Sorry. No. Yeah, so, uh, okay. So, but since Victor mentioned uh, Z uh, mod P to the N, yeah, you can you can just describe uh, what happens to representations of that uh, thing also. But in general, it is not easy to, to find this number. So the fact that we uh, we can prove it, it it is of this form, but if you give me a representation of uh, uh, even z three cross z three in characteristic three, <laughs> then I won't be able to calculate easily this invariant. I know that it is an integer in characteristic three, but which integer? It's not easy to say. There is no software which does it. Yes, there is a software, but <coughs> I I think. Uh, the software may may not give you. I, I'm not sure there is an algorithm to find that number. You, you can uh, have a plausible uh, answer, maybe. So Dave Benson has a program that does that. But 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 if you take a representation of sufficiently large size, of course, if representation is relatively small, there are various ways to uh, to determine what this invariant is. But if uh, if it has dimension, let's say 15, well, 15 divisible by three, let's say 16. Then it's already going to be pretty hard to, to find out what's going on. Uh, okay, so let me explain uh, now uh, what happens. Uh, so, so how to use the theory of tensor category. Uh, so let me recall some basics. So a symmetric tensor category, uh, uh, I will call a symmetric tensor category a category which has the uh, the structures and properties of the category of finite dimensional representations of a group. And so what do I mean by that precisely? So I'm going to work over some algebraically closed field. And at the moment, I'm not making any assumption about its characteristic. And I'm considering categories which are, first of all, k-linear. So morphisms form k-vector spaces and compositions are bilinear. And the categories should be abelian. Also, they should be Artinian category, which means that objects have finite length and home spaces are finite dimensional. And they also should be monoidal, which means there is a tensor product, an associativity morphism unit. Uh, associativity should satisfy pentagon. They should be symmetric, which means that we have a symmetric braiding, x cross y to y cross x. And if I do this twice, I get the identity. And they should be rigid, so that means we have uh, duals and they should satisfy the rigidity axioms. Uh, and then uh, the additive and multiplicative structure has to be connected, which is done by this axiom. The tensor product is bilinear on morphisms. And finally, the endomorphisms of the unit object should be K. So for example, uh, if G is a group, uh, we can look at the category of finite dimensional representations of G over K. And this is a, a symmetric tensor category. I'm going to abbreviate this as STC over this field K. Uh, a basic example of that is, so, so in that case, for example, the unit object is the trivial uh, representation, one dimensional trivial representation. And in the simplest case, when the group is trivial, 
we get the category of vector spaces over k. This is the simplest finite category of finite dimensional vector spaces over k. So that's the simplest uh, example of a symmetric tensor category. And uh, more generally, we can replace uh, a, a group by uh, an affine group scheme over k. So if you have a general group, abstract group, and you look at this category, it can actually always be written as a representation category of an affine group scheme. Namely, this group scheme will be just the pro-algebraic completion of G. So uh, it's the unique affine group scheme whose representation category is this case. Okay, and then uh, the next example, but, but not all uh, symmetric tensor categories are of this form. There is also a category of super vector spaces, uh, S vec K, which is defined when characteristic is not equal to. And uh, this is a category of graded vector spaces by Z mod two. So V equal to V zero plus V one and V zero is the even part and V one is the odd part. Uh, and, uh, uh, but there's a the difference with the usual, uh, of course, we can take the usual category of uh, Z mod two graded vector spaces, and this will be representation certainly of an affine group scheme, uh, uh, which is the dual of uh, the group Z mod two. But, uh, but we will put a, a, a different uh, symmetry, symmetric structure. So CXY of X tensor Y. So for usual representation categories, this is just Y tensor X. But we are going to add a sign minus one to the degree of x degree of y. So for homogeneous x and y, the formula looks like this. And in particular, the only case when it differs from the usual one is when both x and y are odd. In that case, c of x tensor y is minus y tensor x. So that's the Kazul sign rule, which is satisfied for many mathematical objects such as uh, exterior forms, uh, differential forms, cohomology, and so on. Uh, and that category is not of the previous kind. And this can be generalized. We can consider uh, supergroups, or at least super algebras and supergroups. So uh, G could be an affine supergroup scheme over K. So this simply means it's an affine group scheme inside the category of super vector spaces. So that means that we should have a commutative. So what's an affine group scheme? It's a spectrum of a commutative Hopf algebra. So we need to fix a commutative Hopf algebra in the category of super vector space. And in more elementary terms, this means that it's a, uh, it's a super commutative Hopf super algebra. So there are some, you have to put signs in the axioms of the Hopf algebra. And uh, also, uh, well, you can consider representations of this, but actually you can do something slightly, slightly more general. Uh, namely, if you have an element Z in uh, G of K, uh, which is just uh, even po uh, points of the of G over K, or which is the same thing as points of the even part of G over K, uh, which uh, squares to one, and also uh, its conjugation action on the algebra of functions is by parity, so it acts by one on even functions and by minus one on odd functions. So if you have such an element, uh, you can consider. And if you don't have such an element, you can always adjoin it uh, subject to these relations. And if you have such an element, you can consider the category which is denoted by rep GZ. And this is the category of representations of G on super vector spaces such that uh, Z uh, acts by parity. Okay, and so, uh, the definition is that uh, a symmetric tensor category is Tanakian. So this is a definition uh, basically due to Grothendieck and uh, then was developed further by Saavedra Rivano and Delin and Milne. Uh, the kind of ultimate treatment was done in Delin and Milne's uh, paper on Tanakian categories in uh, about 40 years ago. So uh, it's Tanakian if, uh, uh, if it has a fiber functor which is a symmetric uh, tensor functor from uh, this category to the category of vector spaces over K. So, uh, so what does it mean uh, symmetric tensor functor? So tensor functor means that it preserves tensor product and it uh, requires a data which is called tensor structure which should satisfy some hexagon axiom. Uh, 
And symmetric means that it also preserves the braiding. Uh, it should also be uh, uh, exact. And uh, uh, in that case, it's uh, automatically faithful. And uh, it should, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, well, such a functor exists uh, for category of representations of, uh, let's say, uh, a fine uh, group scheme. Namely, this is just the forgetful functor which attaches to a representation its underlying vector space and forgets the structure of the representation. And uh, called fiber functor because, uh, for example, if you can't have the uh, category of uh, local systems of finite dimensional vector spaces on a topological space X, then uh, such a functor can be constructed by taking fiber of this local system uh, or locally constant shift at this point X and X. And uh, that's uh, the source of this terminology. Uh, and uh, so in this case, uh, this functor is, so the linear mill showed that this functor is unique. It's not very hard to prove. And uh, we can define then an affine group scheme, which is uh, uh, the, the scheme of tensor automorphisms of F. So it takes uh, a little bit of work to define the scheme properly, but its points over K are just ordinary tensor automorphisms of F, which are just automorphisms of the functor F, which preserve the tensor product. And then the C simply can be identified with the category of finite dimensional representations, uh, algebraic representations of this affine group scheme G. I should say that when I say that this functor is unique, it's unique up to a non-unique isomorphism. Uh, so uh, for example, when I take fiber of a, a locally constant sheet, uh, I, uh, uh, well, I can take fiber at different points and uh, these fiber functors are isomorphic, but not canonically. To define an isomorphism, we need to uh, uh, connect those two points by, uh, a path, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, we get an isomorphism. And so it depends on the homotopy class of that path. And this has to do, uh, so this G is going to be pro-algebraic completion of the fundamental group of this space. Let's say it's a connected space, uh, but uh, uh, fundamental group requires a base point and this uh, non-uniqueness has to do with the fact that we do not have a canonical choice of the base point. And then we also say that the symmetric tensor category is super Tanakhian, and that's for characteristic not equal to, uh, if there exists a, a fiber functor to super vector spaces. So in this case, uh, F is also unique with the same caveat as I mentioned, and we can define the uh, scheme or uh, uh, super uh, group scheme, uh, uh, a fine super group scheme of tensor automorphisms of F. Uh, and also the scheme comes with an element uh, in its K points, uh, which is an ordinary group. Uh, it's a parity automorphism. So it squares to one, uh, acts by parity in every representation. And the category C can be reconstructed uh, as representations of G and C. So there is a bijection between equivalence classes of such categories and isomorphism classes of pairs G, Z. So any questions up to this point? So this was a review of the basic theory of Tanakhian and super Tanakhian and symmetric tensor categories. And now I want to uh, define the notion of uh, moderate growth. Actually, Pavel, before you go on, is it okay yeah. if we take a, a five minute break at this point? Break, okay. Yeah, uh, we usually, usually take Try to so we can meet back at uh, about three thirty-five. Oh, okay, and, uh, sure. Yeah. Yes, whenever you're ready. Okay, so uh, so uh, the next definition I want to make is the following: so symmetric tensor category C has moderate growth. Uh, if uh, for every object there exists a, a constant Cx, a real number, such that uh, for any uh, n, uh, 
the length of the nth tensor power of x is at most this constant to the nth power. So for example, if x is a representation uh, of a group or supergroup G, then uh, we can take for the Cx to be the, uh, just the dimension of this representation, just over k as a vector space over k. And so therefore it's a moderate growth. Not all categories are of moderate growth. There are these Deline categories, rep GLT, for example, which many people saw. So they are faster growth, but uh, for moderate growth, it turns out that there, uh, in characteristic zero, there is nothing more than what we have discussed. And this is a great theorem of Deline from 2002. So it says that the symmetric tensor category over K uh, of characteristic zero is super Tanakian if and only if it is of moderate growth. So moderate growth categories are the same as super Tanakian categories or categories of representations of super groups. Well, with this element Z, but really essentially super. That's a great theorem. So it shows that such categories can be studied by means of Lie theory. And in some sense, Lie theory or rather super Lie theory uh, or algebraic, algebraic super Lie theory is more or less the theory of such categories. Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, this theorem is not true in characteristic P. And uh, to demonstrate it, I will, uh, so I will explain a counter example to this theorem. Uh, and uh, uh, to explain it, I need to, to discuss the notion of semi-simplification. So before that, any questions up to this point? So again, uh, so growth is de defined in terms of um, just dimension in the sense of uh, symmetric tensor categories? Or in no, 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 no. We cannot use dimension in terms of symmetric tensor category because that's a number in our field. But to growth should be real, uh, measured by real numbers. No, it's uh, determined by length. Uh, so the condition is that the length of x to the n, so the number of elements in the composition series of x to the n, should be less than or equal than cx to the n. Does it answer your question, Robert? Yes, yes. Okay. Other questions? All right. So, so what is semi-simplification? So suppose we are given an additive rigid symmetric monoidal category. So I'm not assuming that it's abelian over the, my field K, again, of any characteristic at this point. And suppose the endomorphisms of the unit is K. So the main difference from the previous setting uh, is uh, that I don't require it to be abelian. And then there is a no notion of trace of a morphism. Actually, this notion exists just for monoidal categories. It doesn't need to be additive. So uh, if you have a morphism from an object to itself, uh, then you can define its trace, which is an element of K, in general, just an element of endomorphisms of the identity uh, object. Is, and this is defined as follows. So I start with the unit. Uh, I do the co-evaluation map from unit to X tensor X dual, that's a part of the structure of rigid category. Then I uh, uh, apply my morphism in the first component here. Then I uh, uh, switch the components. And then there is evaluation morphism, uh, which goes back to the unit object. And then the composition is a map from the unit object to itself, which means a number in my field, which is called trace of map. And in particular, we have the notion of categorical dimension, uh, which is just the trace of the identity. And now uh, comes the main definition for this theory of semi-simplification, which says that a, a morphism f from x to y uh, is negligible if uh, for every morphism the other way, the trace of the composition is zero. And by the way, it, it's easy to show that trace of fg equals to trace of gf. So it doesn't matter which order you take the composition. And one uh, lemma is that uh, these negligible morphisms form a tensor ideal. 
it's, it's a more general kind of tensor ideal than what I mentioned before, because it's a tensor ideal of morphisms. So this is a collection of subspaces, uh, N of X, Y in home from X to Y in my category for every objects X and Y. And uh, being a, a tensor ideal means that uh, this N is uh, stable under composition with uh, any morphism on any side and also under tensor product with any. Another lemma that we will need is that, uh, 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 well, you can uh, define a quotient category. If you have a tensor ideal, you can always define a quotient monoidal category, C bar, which is C mod N. And uh, this is defined by saying that objects of C bar are the same as objects of C. And morphisms in C bar are morphisms in C quotiented by the subspace N of X1. Uh, in general, this uh, category could be rather nasty, but uh, uh, lemma is that if uh, uh, trace of any nilpotent endomorphisms in C is zero, then this quotient uh, is a semi-simple symmetric tensor category. So in that case, the quotient is abelian and moreover semi-simple. So every object is a direct sum of simple objects. So, uh, well, I mean, there is this condition. So you might ask how general this is. So, so indeed there are examples, uh, and in fact, quite natural examples where this condition fails, but uh, also there are many examples when it holds. For example, that's true if our category C is abelian to start with. In that case, uh, for any important endomorphism, we have a filtration uh, of the object by trace uh, by kernels of powers of this endomorphism. And uh, by using this filtration and taking associated graded, uh, and uh, we can associated graded of it will be zero and trace of a morphism always equals to the trace of its associated grade. So we will get this property. And in fact, your category C does not have to be abelian uh, for that. It just needs to have a, monoidal functor into an abelian case. Because you can always, this trace is invariant with respect to monoidal functors. And so you can always compute it after evaluation of this monoidal functor. Um, so, and then as long as you're in an abelian category, you're fine. So, uh, and this property is satisfied in all examples we care. About. So we don't have to worry about it. And then uh, there is also an explicit description in this case of uh, negligible morphisms. This is a lemma which was proved uh, a long time ago by Dave Denson, maybe before this theory was developed and he proved it just in the setting of group representation uh, 40 years ago. So uh, the lemma, uh, it's, it's not difficult, but important. Uh, uh, under the assumption above, first of all, how to characterize uh, uh, negligible morphisms. Well, it turns out that it's easier to characterize non-negligible morphisms. So if X and Y are indecomposable, then a morphism from X to Y is not negligible, if and only if it is, first of all, an isomorphism. And secondly, the dimension of X, and the, here it's a categorical dimension in the field K is non-zero. So if at least one of those two conditions fails, then uh, our F is negative. And the second uh, fact is that uh, if you have a morphism between arbitrary objects, which are decomposed uh, into direct sums, then uh, for it to be negligible, uh, it's equivalent to say that all components, so you have a matrix Fij and all the entries of this matrix, which are maps from Xi to Yj have to be negative. And uh, what follows from this description is the following, that uh, simple objects in this, semi uh, in this category C bar uh, are in decomposable uh, objects in C uh, of non-zero dimension. Because what this procedure does, it forces Schur's lemma to be satisfied. So if you look at the endomorphism algebra, so first of all, morphisms between non-isomorphic uh, in decomposable objects are all killed. They are all negligible. Uh, uh, and morphisms uh, from uh, such an indecomposable object to itself, they form a local algebra, 
uh, and uh, the uh, nil radical of this algebra is skill uh, uh, because uh, if you have a nil potent endomorphism, its composition with anything is going to be nil potent, and uh, then uh, its trace will be zero. Uh, but the identity morphism may or may not be killed. Uh, if dimension is not zero, then it is not killed. But if dimension is zero, then it is killed. And so objects, uh, so simple objects of this category are in decomposables in C, but only of non-zero dimension. Uh, because if you have zero dimension, then identity morphism becomes zero. And so the object itself becomes zero. So the objects of C bar are the same as objects of C, but some uh, objects which were non-zero in, in C can become zero in C bar. Uh, and uh, this is exactly why I considered in the previous application only I was counting objects of non-zero dimension because otherwise this technique is not going to apply to that problem. So, uh, well, I mean, this is a, a good news and a bad news. A good news is that we get a semi-simple category, which is a simpler than, I, I should say that this is called uh, C bar, is called the semi-simplification of C. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so, so, so in general, uh, you will get a very complicated category because, okay, good news is semi simple, but the bad news is that you cannot really describe all the indecomposables in general. Like for the group Z3 cross Z3, we don't have a good description of all indecomposables. But in some cases, we can do that. And the simplest example is, of course, uh, uh, representations of uh, the group uh, Z mod P in characteristic P, which is the example we already considered. So if I take my category C to be that, then it's indecomposables at J1 up to JP. Uh, and uh, so these are Jordan blocks of sizes one through P. Uh, and uh, they define uh, simple objects in my category C bar, L1 through LP minus one. They come from J1 to J P minus one, but uh, we don't have a LP because J P, the P by P Jordan block gets killed because it's an indecomposable of dimension P, which is zero in K. In this case, dimension, of course, categorical dimension is the usual vector space dimension projected to the uh, field of characteristic P. Now, how does the tensor product look like in this case? Well, I told you in characteristic zero, Jordan blocks tensor in the same way as representations of SL2 because uh, simply representation of SL2 is determined by the action of the element E. Uh, so we are supposed to get a, something like Klebs Gordon rule. And if we did not have these P minus M, P minus N here, that would be exactly the Klebs Gordon rule for SL2 representations. But it's a truncated Klebs Gordon rule because that rule of tensoring only holds when your indices are much smaller than P. And uh, the, 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 the full formula is uh, taking into account that we are killing some things is uh, this where we sum not to minimum of MN but to minimum of MN P minus M and P minus N. And uh, so for this reason, this is actually the Verlinde rule, which is the tensor product rule in uh, representations of affine uh, Lie algebra, uh, SL2 hat at positive integer level, uh, P minus two, uh, or uh, also a quantum group uh, for root of unity of uh, order two P, which is Q, the Q that I already mentioned. Uh, and, and for this purpose, uh, so, so that's called Verlin de Ring from physics literature. And for this reason, this category we call it Berlin the category, although uh, it's in denoted by verb P. Uh, although I will explain that actually it first uh, uh, in characteristic P version of this category, which is what we are talking about, was constructed in the 90s in a different way than by different people. So I will get to that. But uh, let me mention one variant. Uh, we can replace the group Z mod P by the group scheme alpha P, whose function algebra uh, is just the K of X modular X to the P where X is a primitive element. 
and it is a self-dual uh, affine group, finite group scheme. And also, uh, okay, so uh, the category VER2 has only one simple object, so it's just the category of vector spaces. VER3 is uh, the category of super vector spaces. Uh, and VER5, uh, well, uh, what do we have? Uh, so, that so far, we don't have any quantum counter examples. But when we get to VER5, this has this object L3. And um, when we tensor it, so L, uh, J3 tensor J3 is J1 plus J3 plus J5, as we already saw. But when we pass to L's, then we get X tensor X is just one plus X because there is no L5. And so uh, this uh, immediately implies that this category VER5 has no fiber functor uh, into vector or super vector spaces uh, because if F were such a functor, and f of x was the corresponding vector space of some dimension d, then this d would have to satisfy an equation coming from here, which is d squared equals to d plus one. And this equation doesn't have integer solutions. So we cannot have a vector space whose dimension is the golden ratio. So that's why we don't have a functor left. Uh, and uh, maybe I should mention that uh, for p grade uh, the, the or equal to two, greater or equal to three, this category can be factorized into a product of the even highest weight part, which is ver p plus, and the category of super vector spaces, which is generated by L1 and L p minus one. So it's actually a tensor product of two pieces. Um, and here is the, the other construction, how it historically appeared in the work of Sergei Gelfand and David Kashdan and also Georgi von Matteo in early 1990s, they considered the tilting category of uh, the algebraic group SL2K and uh, considered the semi-simplification of that tilting category. That's a, this is not an abelian category, it's just a, a, a additive tensor category, but uh, trace of every nil potent endomorphism is zero because it embeds into the entire representation category of this group and so we can construct semi-simplification, which, uh, uh, so the sim uh, indecomposable objects here are labeled by positive integers. They are tilting modules Ti, but uh, all of those have uh, dimension divisible by P except uh, uh, T zero through T P minus two. And so we get P minus one simple objects and it's easy to check that we get exactly this category of work. So, uh, any questions up to this point? All right, so since this category has no fiber functor, maybe we should uh, view it as the target because remember we had uh, affine group schemes and those project to vector spaces. But then we found an example, super vector spaces, which doesn't project to vector spaces. So then we pass to categories that project to super vector spaces and we discover super groups. So we should do the same thing here. Whenever the theorem fails, whenever we don't have a fiber functor, make that the target, the receptacle of fiber functors and see how general are the categories that you can get. And then a uh, max counter example, you can make the target again and so on. So that's the ideology of this kind of theory. And now it turns out that if you make that the target, you actually get a whole lot of categories. So that starts with the remarkable discovery of Ostrich in 2015, who proved the following theorem, that suppose C is a fusion symmetric tensor category over P for characteristic P, which means a, uh, it has finitely many simple objects and also semi-simple. Then there is a fiber functor from C to ver P and it's also unique. And so this means, okay, so when we had a fiber functor into super spaces, for example, that meant that our category was the representation category of a super group. Uh, and similarly here, uh, we will get an affine group scheme uh, in, uh, uh, in this case, finite group scheme in the category of ver P and one can try to Classify such schemes, at least uh, semi-simple ones and so on. So do some Lie theory in this category. And uh, okay, this is with respect to the fundamental group, which is a technicality I won't explain, uh, but you will get a Lie theoretic description of this category. 
So this uh, simply means that uh, uh, studies of such categories uh, reduces to the study of Lie theory or the theory of algebraic groups in this category work. So, so this means that to understand such categories, we need to study affine group schemes in verb P. Perhaps we should study polynomial functors uh, which act on verb P and so on. These problems are uh, difficult and very interesting and we've been working on them, making some progress, uh, but this is beside the point of this talk. Now, the question is what about symmetric tensor categories which aren't fused, which are, do not have finitely many objects and are not necessarily same as So in this case, it fails. And there is a simple counter example, actually for category of spine with only one simple object, but not semi-simple. It's a, you know, the simplest possible counter example you can imagine, characteristic two. So you simply take the Hopf algebra H, which is the group algebra of the affine group scheme alpha two. So it's K of D over D squared and D is a primitive element. Well, that by itself is Tanakian. It has a, a fiber functor to vector spaces, but we are going to uh, change the commutativity isomorphism. Uh, so that means that instead of ordinary permutation, we uh, multiply this permutation by this one tensor one plus D tensor D. So it turns out that this uh, defines a symmetric category structure. And this is a kind of uh, replacement of super vector spaces and characteristic two. So in characteristic two, we cannot put signs, but this plays the role of signs. And in fact, you can show that there, this is a reduction mod uh, to characteristic two of uh, a certain uh, uh, form, uh, integer form of the category of super vector spaces over two edic uh, integers, or rather two edic integers to which you have a joint square root of two. So that's a ramified extension of uh, uh, two edic integers. And this is a triangular Hopf algebra in the sense of Drinfeld. So it has this triangular R matrix, which defines a, a symmetric category. And so this category doesn't have a functor into ver two, which is a category of vector spaces. It doesn't come from an ordinary uh, affine group scheme. And there are similar examples in characteristic P greater than two, although they are more complicated. They are constructed in uh, my work with uh, Ostrich and Dave Benson. Uh, and uh, I'm not gonna say more about this because the talk is not about this. Uh, so let me explain what prevents this category from having a fiber functor to ver two. And uh, before doing so, are there any questions? All right. Uh, so, uh, so, so the way you can see that, well, of course, in, in the category, which is as simple as this, it's pretty easy just to check directly. But uh, the conceptual way of doing it, which also explains why conceptually it doesn't have such a functor, is to consider uh, the notion of Frobenius functor. So in characteristic uh, P, the important uh, ingredient in uh, modular representation theory is Frobenius uh, functor on representation categories of algebraic groups, which simply uh, is induced by the Frobenius map uh, in, uh, on the algebraic group, which uh, basically raises uh, regular function to piece powers. And uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of representations, what this functor does uh, in characteristic two, for example, is the following thing. Uh, so uh, you take an object X, which uh, uh, is an object of your category in characteristic two, you consider the tensor square X tensor X. And in this tensor square, you have an uh, operator uh, one plus P and the morphism one plus P where P is the permutation of control. Now, because P squared is one uh, in characteristic two, this means that uh, one plus P squares to zero. So you can view that as a differential and you can compute its cohomology. So this is the kernel of one plus P modular image of one plus P. So more precisely, what you can say is that this X cross X has a three-step filtration. The top piece is wedge two X and the bottom piece is wedge two X. And then this is this X one, which is uh, really the Frobenius of X. 
and uh, uh, you have uh, things like uh, so symmetric uh, square is a quotient by wedge two, and so this is a uh, s two of x, and uh, this is gamma two, the divided power symmetric square, and so this Frobenius is, is this x one, so it's a cohomology of this operator one plus two. Now, if you calculate, uh, and, and in usual representation theory, this is an exact functor because it is just going to be the same space on which the scalar multiplication has been twisted by uh, the map x goes to x to the t. However, in this case, if you do the exercise, you discover because of this funny commutativity morphism, uh, what you will get is uh, uh, that uh, Frobenius of H of the regular representation is zero, while Frobenius of the trivial representation is itself. So if you start with a short exact sequence, zero to one to H to one to zero, uh, non-split short exact sequence, this Frobenius functor maps it to a sequence like this, which is not exact on the left or on the right. Uh, and uh, uh, and so this functor turns out to be non-exact. And in fact, it's not exact either on the left or on the right. On the other hand, this is an additive functor. So on an, every semi-simple uh, symmetric tensor category, it will be exact because any additive functor on the semi-simple category is exact. And also it commutes. Uh, so what you can show what's uh, not obvious from this definition, but is true, is that even though this functor x tensor x is quadratic in x, this functor is actually additive uh, and uh, it's, it's twisted linear. So it, multiple, uh, it maps scalars to their squares, but otherwise it's linear. Uh, and, uh, and, so, uh, and also it's monoidal. That's also not completely obvious, but can be shown. So this functor uh, commutes with tensor functor, which is, uh, uh, and, and also it commutes with, uh, with tensor functors, uh, uh, which is, I, I guess, uh, clear because tensor functors are exact and preserve tensor functors. So, uh, and so this means that C does not admit a for faithful uh, tensor functor into any semi-simple symmetric tensor category, and in particular in uh, interver uh, two, in this case, which, which is vector space. And in fact, you can define these Frobenius functors. So, so in other words, the obstruction to existence of this fiber functor is the failure of this Frobenius functor to be exact. And so uh, you can define these Frobenius functors for higher P, but that's uh, less trivial. And uh, this was done by Ostrich. Uh, so there are actually another version of, of that theory due to Kevin Pullenbier and those are closely related to each other. And we in fact use both of them in our theory. But let me explain Ostrich's version, uh, which comes from his paper in 2015. So if you have an object X, uh, then you uh, raise it to pth power. So we took square last time, now we're gonna raise to pth power. And instead of permutation uh, P that we had, we will have cyclic permutation, which cyclically permutes the X, uh, X is in this product. So C to the P equals to one. So this means that this X to the P is not just an object of C, but it's an equivariant object with respect to the group Z mod P. So it's an object of this tensor, pro the lean tensor product of the category C with representations of Z mod P. Uh, and we can consider its image in uh, semi-simplification. So we can semi-simplify with respect to this component, but not with respect to this one. And we can project to here. And so we will get this uh, monoidal functor, additive and twisted linear. From C to C tensor with ver P. And uh, so you can decompose because ver P is semi-simple you can write that as a direct sum of Li's with some coefficients which are uh, just functors to vector spaces and which I call Fri of X. So Fri, Frobenius of X is this direct sum. Uh, 
And uh, you can describe this functor in pure linear algebra. This is done in our paper with Ostrich. Uh, so basically you have a filtration uh, on X to the P by kernels of powers of one minus C. It's like a Delin filtration in Hodge theory. And uh, that exists because it's nil potent, its P power is zero. Uh, and uh, you can express this FRI in, in terms of the linear algebra of that. I will not uh, write down exact formulas. It's not so important for this case. And then uh, the theorem is that uh, C is Frobenius exact. So definition is that C is called Frobenius exact if this functor is exact. And here is the main theorem, which we proved recently. And it says that a category C, symmetric tensor category C, is Frobenius exact and of moderate growth, if and only if it admits uh, a fiber functor to Berlin the P. And in that case, this functor is unique. So the, the class of such categories which project to Ver P are exactly those of uh, Frobenius exact and modular, moderate. In other words, you can generalize the theorem of Delin to characteristic P uh, by uh, imposing this additional condition of Frobenius exactness uh, and uh, also relaxing the condition that you have to project to vector spaces or super vector spaces and replacing it with verb P. Okay, and uh, in particular, uh, this holds for any semi-simple symmetric tensor category. And uh, I think I should probably wrap up, but I uh, may I uh, talk for another five minutes? Yes, it's mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, so I, I will explain how this can be applied to the problem in modular representation theory that we discussed. So, so how do you apply it? Uh, so remember what we did is we took a modular representation and we raised it to power n, and then we uh, counted uh, uh, in decomposables uh, which have non-zero dimension. This is really a computation in the semi-simplification of the category uh, of representations of this group. So, uh, so we consider C, which you take representations uh, over K of our group or group scheme, and, and then we take uh, its semi-simplification. And then, uh, so, uh, what you do is, uh, so this D of X, uh, DN of X is simply the length of X bar to the N, where X bar is the image. So C is representations. And this C bar is a semi-simplification. So it, it, uh, X bar is the image of X. But uh, uh, then you can prove, uh, but, but, then, uh, but this theory really allows you to describe this category very, uh, you know, quite explicitly. Uh, so the main theorem implies that the representations over K of G bar is, it is for Benio's exact because it's semi-simple. So it has a functor to ver P. So there exists a functor to ver P. And, uh, and this category is really uh, representations uh, over K of some, not over K, but uh, in ver P. So there is some affine group scheme G bar. It's an affine group scheme uh, in ver P. And uh, you, you can write this category in this way as basically representations of this affine group scheme. And moreover, it's a semi-simple affine group scheme. Uh, or, or linearly, maybe I should call it linearly reductive, linearly reductive affine group scheme. And linearly reductive for algebraic groups, it means that representation category is semi-simple. 
And then, uh, well, one thing that you can derive from this is that uh, this dn of uh, x, uh, so the, this d of, so what you can derive from this, so, so actually those semi-simple uh, or linear reductive affine group schemes are not very hard to classify in some sense. Well, at least up to some finite data. Well, they have this even part, which is uh, somehow the bulk of it, which is an algebraic group, linear reductive algebraic group. And about those, we have a uh, theorem of Nagata, which says that they're basically tori. In characteristic P, there are a few, there, there is a, there is a, lot, a lot fewer um, algebraic groups which have semi-simple representation. They're basically all tori, semi-directly uh, multiplied by uh, a group of order prime to P. And so using that, what you can deduce from this is that uh, this uh, uh, D of X actually is the same as D of F of X. But F of X lies in ver P and in, in finite, it's a finite category. So for every Y in ver P, D of Y, it's pretty easy to show, is just what is called Frobenius Perron dimension of Y, which is the largest eigenvalue of the matrix of multiplication by Y. So if you have finitely many simple objects, then every simple object gives you a matrix of multiplication by this object. And this matrix has positive elements. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and so you have this thing. And, and this is a character, uh, which means uh, that uh, the original D of X is a character. And another thing is that if I computed for L, LM, this is what Ben asked about. Uh, this is just M cubed. And this implies the result that I explained. And another thing that we get this way is that uh, we get more than that actually, because we, well, we get that, uh, first of all, a pretty good description of uh, this category. So we can make much more precise statement about uh, in decomposables of non-zero dimension that arise in the tensor product. But another corollary we get, which can be formulated elementary, in an elementary way is the following, that for every X uh, in rep K of G, so this is still a finite group or a finite group scheme, there exists a constant, uh, let me call it M sub X uh, in R greater than zero, such that for every Y, uh, an indecomposable summoned in x to the n, x star to the m, for any n and m, d of y is less than or equal than mx. So when you tensor x and x dual many times, you get many, many indecomposables. You can get infinitely many very easily, but their growth rate is bounded uniformly by some constant depending only on X. And that's really the consequence of this fact that all connected uh, algebraic groups and characteristic P whose representation category is semi-simple are tori. And representations of tori are one dimensional. So when you have basically a finite group semi-direct with a torus, uh, uh, then representations of that have bounded, irreducible representations of that have bounded dimension. And so this is really, how you can see that. So there are some problems in this theory which we still don't know how to solve, but uh, uh, so maybe let me finish by giving this example. Uh, so uh, let's say a characteristic of K equal two and um, uh, uh, G is a finite group. So in this case, uh, Berlin the two is vector spaces. So our, uh, Theorem basically says that our category is Tanakian. So representations uh, K of G bar, which is C bar, is Tanakian. So this is just representations over K of G bar, where uh, G bar is a linearly reductive affine group scheme. And so, uh, well, uh, so this means that it basically, uh, uh, well, uh, I mean, it's convenient to take some object X and generate a subcategory 
in here by this x, which means we are going to take all the direct summons and tensor products of x and x star with any powers. And so this is a finitely generated category. So this is going to be representations over k of some g bar x. And this is actually a finite type of fine group scheme. And so Nagata's theorem classifies such schemes. And it says that gx bar is the following. So uh, there is a short exact sequence uh, gx bar. So that projects to gamma. And this is an odd order finite group. And kernel is uh, like this. And this is a, a dual of finite abelian two group. And T is a torus. So uh, now there is conjecture of Benson, which says that uh, for any X in decomposable. So if your group, so conjecture of Benson says so, uh, that uh, uh, if G is a two group, then uh, for any X uh, in decomposable of odd dimension, X tensor X dual, well, it will have unit representation, trivial representation as a direct summons. But the rest is uh, uh, the direct sum of even dimensional indecomposables. So the only odd dimensional indecomposable is uh, K. So this really means that X is invertible in the semi-simplification. And this theorem is equivalent, this is a conjecture. So this is a conjecture and it is still not proved. Our technique is not strong enough to prove this, but what uh, this is equivalent to say is that this group gamma is one. So for a general uh, group, uh, the we can generalize this conjecture, which is actually equivalent to the original formulation is that if your G is any finite group, then this group gamma uh, should be uh, uh, smaller or equal to, uh, uh, I think it's a quotient of the normalizer of the seal of two subgroup of G. So general gamma is a quotient of seal of two subgroup. So that's Benson's conjecture. And it's confer confirmed by many, many, many computer calculations. But we seem to be still missing an important idea how to prove this to, in order to prove this. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Pavel, for that very interesting talk. Are there any questions? Can I ask, so um, in this uh, construction, uh, well, I mean, entering the definition of Fabinius exactness. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you took the tensor uh, power and then viewed it as an ZP equivariant object. Right. And then you the simplification along ZP, right? Right. But, um, well, first it's, uh, well, just comments kind of reminds this uh, Smith Theory construction, right? When one, um, yes, yes, goes to the stable category, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. And also the question is, you know, you can also. So, so in fact, it factors through that construction. So you can first project to the stable category and then project to the semi simplification, because the ideal of the stable category is smaller than the ideal of the semi simplification. But also, uh, like in studying this as an equivariant object, so there's a Steenrod operations which are, can be used. Um, well, just yeah. uh, 
homological algebra of this. Um, yes, yes, yes. And so I don't know if they can be, um, if they play a role here. Or I'm sure have... it does play a role, but we haven't, uh, we haven't been able to uh, develop a technology that has application yet. But, uh, but what you can do, for example, uh, one uh, thing in characteristic two uh, that you have here, uh, so in characteristic two, well, this is um, it is. Uh, so so uh, this Frobenius factor. I said that it wasn't exact. So if you have a, a short exact sequence x y z to zero, uh, and uh, uh, then Frobenius uh, is not exact. So uh, but it's exact in the middle. It's always exact in the middle. That's not difficult to show. And in fact, there is a periodic sequence. So it goes to f of x and so on. So uh, uh, so, so, so there is a three periodic sequence like that. Uh, so, so in fact, uh, maybe the right way to think about it is that uh, there is an exact functor uh, in the sense of uh, derived categories. So you attach to X, you attach the complex uh, or maybe even uh, DG categories. So you just attach the state complex, X cross X, X cross X, X cross X, and so on where this map is uh, one plus P everywhere. And, and then one can try to see, uh, so the, this is, uh, you can think of it as being monoidal and so on. And uh, you can try to see what you can get from this. And um, I haven't been able to apply this idea yet. And in some sense, it's also not relevant to this talk because this talk was about the case when this Frobenius functor is exact. But, but it is definitely very interesting and I would like to connect this business to homotopy theory as well. Thanks. Adima had a question. Oh, I, I have a question. Ah, yes. Okay. No, no, just a very trivial. So, so you said that this this is the generalization of the Lin's theorem, but I don't see why. Why is that just analog or or, or general? You can deduce from this. If you have to reduce the lean in classic zero, can you deduce from this? Uh, well, I mean, you, you can't directly deduce the lean characteristic zero from this because we are working in positive characteristic, but the methods by which it is proved can be, they are really in some parts of, of the proof are adapted from the lean's uh, approach. Oh. Okay. Dima Nikšić had question. No, no, I didn't. Oh, okay. Asha, can you go up a, a two slides or something? Yes. I, I didn't understand when you were explaining this application for your numbers at the beginning, why D of uh, the, uh, there, back there. What, why, what, what, what is... why D of X equals D of F of X? Ah, I did not explain that. So, uh, so the reason is uh, basically that, uh, uh, so of course, if you take X to the nth power, uh, this has fewer uh, composition factors than F of X to the nth power. Uh, but the difference is not that big because of this uh, story with uh, linearly reductive affine group schemes. So they, they don't have, their representations are, have bounded dimension. And so the dis distinction between those two lengths is not to be for that reason. Does it answer your question? Oh, you are muted. Sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, that answers my question. Sorry, I gave you a thumbs up, but. Ah, okay. Pavel, I have a quick question. I don't know if it's well posed though. Um, so uh, you were saying earlier how Z mod PZ and finite characteristic is the same as this, uh, you know, K adjoin X mod X to the P, which That's is a group right. ring. And then these, these dimensions D, D of an object in the Verlinda is really the same as the graded dimension. Um, I mean, their secret, so th this description of this, uh, also, suggesting something like this: the, uh, 
like when you do other groups in finite characteristic, is there secretly some graded component going on somewhere? But what do, what do you mean by graded? I mean, we have Q is, Q is a root of unity here. We don't have anything with Q variable. Well, well, but if you take modules over K join X mod X to the P, graded modules. And oh, then you graded mod modules. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, sorry. I understand what you said. Uh, uh, so actually, it's an ender. Uh, I, well, I mean, what you can try to do is you can try to take a two group and uh, then compare it uh, to the uh, uh, represent uh, so semi simplification of the representation category with the semi simplification of the associated grade uh, i do not know if uh, they are uh, uh, how they are related i don't know i mean if you take more complicated groups like already zp cross zp for example uh, i don't know definitely the categories the, even the, the tensor product rule, the split growth and decrease are different. Uh, but uh, whether after semi simplification there will be any connection, I don't uh, don't know. But definitely they are very similar, and there are ways. But you you see these uh, these categories are very complicated because they have very many objects. So the right way to study them is to take an object and see what it generates and then try to understand that piece. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe go back to your main theorem about um, where you characterize the, the tensor categories in terms of having a functor to- Yes. Okay. So what yeah, so my question was, so in principle, if you look at the category for like of tilting modules for a reductive algebraic group, and you quotient out some smaller tensor ideals and the negligible morphisms, and um, like all these, I mean, of course, all these have a functor to, uh, to Verlinde P by this, uh, by what you explained previously, that, that do your techniques shed some light on the tensor structure on these, on these like bigger categories? Uh so they have functor to Berlin the P, but this functor will kill all negligible morphisms. Mm -hmm. So uh, no, so quotients by other ideals. So if you take SL2, there is actually ideals are labeled by integers. So there is there, are, there is a sequence of Steinbergs, the first Steinberg, second Steinberg, third Steinberg, and so on. And quotient by first Steinberg is this category of P. Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, for first time that generates the ideal of negligible morphisms. Uh, but uh, uh, then uh, you can take a quotient by second uh, and third and so on. And those are, uh, so I, 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 I so, so those are smaller ideals and uh, quotients by them are not abelian in general, but they have abelian envelopes. And those exactly examples, uh, which I mentioned, uh, which we found by with Ostrich and Benson. Uh, but for higher rank groups, the story is much more complicated. There are a lot more tensor ideals and most of them quotients are not embeddable into abelian tensor categories. So, uh, mm. And they are kind of well. I mean, you can map them. You can construct a functor which is not faithful from them to to their p, but, but that functor will kill all negligible morphisms. Okay. I had a quick question. So, in the in the sequence at the end, what did you say? Gamma was. You said something about the normalizer of the zero, or? Uh, so. Uh, a quotient of the norm, I'm sorry, I did not write the normal, uh, I should write normalizer. Right, okay, yeah. The okay, seal super, of yeah. Modular the seal of sub. Right. Okay, super. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and uh, so, uh, so gamma, so we should have N of uh, G2 over G2 and G2 gamma. 
So that's the conjecture. All right. Do, 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 you know, do you know, do you have a guess what, what it should be more exactly, except that it should? So for, uh, uh, I know the conjecture is that actually, uh, I, uh, I'm sorry. I, I think the, uh, I think the, uh, the conjecture is that they equal. What is clear yeah. is that gamma, I, 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 I uh, Okay, so I, I didn't say that. Uh, so, uh, so in general, the conjecture is a day. What, what is clear is that uh, be, uh, uh, the group gamma is at least as big as this. But uh, the idea, uh, so, so I think maybe the map is the other way. Uh, but, but the conjecture is that this is an isomorphism. Okay, that's good. Okay, okay, fantastic. And this actually is equivalent to the conjecture just for two groups. Because semi-simplification of the category of representations of a finite group can be expressed in terms of semi-simplification of representations of its seal of two subgroups. Namely, it is just the equivariantization of the category of representations of the seal of two subgroups with respect to the normalizer of the subgroup modulo the subgroup. So any other question? Do you have any uh, thoughts on like, uh, now, now that you know that these fiber functors to the Verlinda category exist, uh, say in, in the like, in the group theoretic setting, is there any like, uh, sort of more representation theoretic description we might hope for of like what uh, what these fiber functors are, uh, maybe for certain classes of groups. Well, it's hard to calculate them. Well, like I said, even this invariant, for example, if we knew that what these functors were, it would be a trivial matter to compute this G of X. But computing this G of X is, uh, is actually, if I, if you give me a representation of even Z mod three cross Z mod three, let's say like, I don't know, seven dimensional, maybe, you know, 11 dimensional representation. It will be very hard for me to say what that number is. I mean, using a computer, you can try to compute, but, uh, but it will be hard to say. Any other questions? This is so I'm not sure if Mackie is still there, but um, let's um, thank. I'm still here. Yeah. Pasha again. Yeah. Yeah. So if there are no questions, let's let's thank Pablo again.